Luke 16. We're going to look at the rich man and Lazarus in our series on parables. And what I want to ask, the, I, want to, I want to have us ask the question, and as we've been looking at parables, we want to ask the question as we're reading this, is this story a parable? Now, we know what the other parables were. We're going to try to compare this and see if this would be also considered a parable. I want to read the whole chapter, though, so we get the context. It says this in verse 1. And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him uh, that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou wast not no longer <clears throat> be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called unto every one of his, his Lord's debtors and said unto him, <clears throat> uh, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down, quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that whenever ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. <clears throat> now, we've already looked at that parable um, in a different order than it's given to us in Luke. So, <clears throat> but this helps us understand the context of the next uh, thing, which is the rich man and Lazarus. Verse 10, Jesus continues uh, his conclusion of that parable. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the righteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If ye have, been, have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for what for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier uh, for uh, heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of swords. And he, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, uh, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. <clears throat> and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. All right, so it's a lot there. 
probably, uh, or hopefully, as you've, you're reading through it, you're coming up with lots of things. You say, man, I'd like, like to have an answer to that. I'd like to have an answer to that. Um, I hopefully will answer some of those today, but I'm pretty confident I won't be able to answer all of them. There's actually at least one question that I'm not completely sure on yet. Uh, but we, the big question is this. Is this story a parable or, or is it a true story? Now, when we ask that question, we first have to acknowledge that we don't know that any of the other parables are false stories, that they aren't true stories, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan could have been about an actual event that actually happened, though Jesus used it as a, as a symbolism, right? Um, the, the, the man who fell among thieves was the, was, found that his neighbor was the Samaritan, even though... Uh, the priest and the Levite and everyone else were his countrymen. They did not help him. The, the, the Samaritan was the actual neighbor. Um, but uh, the other, most of the other parables are actually rather simple. There's not a whole lot of story there. It's a sower sowed seed. Some of it grows and some of it doesn't, right? I mean, that's, of course, that's a, true, that's a true story, right? So whether or not this parable doesn't necessarily mean that this is or isn't a true story, but it does seem to very obviously be a true story. We'll see that in a minute. Now, the reason some people will argue that this account is a parable is because they don't want to come to the conclusion that there is an actual hell. This is a teaching that's out there. It's false. And that is that there is no such thing as hell. That hell is, is just, you know, when, when people who are lost die, they're just, they just go off into oblivion. They are consumed. They are burnt up. Um, and uh, there is no such thing as a continual eternal torment. Um, that is false. That's, that's certainly not what we're told in the Bible. Revelation makes it very clear. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever. Um, they are, uh, the, hell is eternal. It's the lake of fire. Um, they are tormented there day and night forever, the book of Revelation says. So uh, we know that's not the case. Um, but this is usually the reason why some will suggest that this is a parable. Let's recap the story. What happens is Jesus, in response to the Pharisees, we'll talk more about the details of what the Pharisees were saying. Um, Jesus, in response to them, tells them this, this story. The story is that there's a rich man who fares sumptuously. He has everything he could, he could want. And there's a poor man who's laying at the rich man's gate. The reason he would lay at the gate of the rich man would be because the rich man must be a generous man, right? That's why a poor man would lay at your gate, because he's expecting that he'll probably get something from you. Maybe it was common for him to, you know, throw him a coin or some food or whatever. Um, and he was desiring to be fed of the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, meaning the, the rich man apparently had a practice of taking the crumbs that fell and throwing it to the poor man. And he probably felt pretty good about himself. Um, for being so generous to the poor man. Well, when they both die, the rich man finds himself swapping places with the poor man. The rich man's now in torment and in anguish and in suffering, where the poor man is now in comfort and at peace and has all the pleasures that he didn't have before. We'll talk a little bit more about this place, Abraham's bosom, and the gap that's between them. But essentially, wherever they were, there was communication, it was, it was able for the two to communicate between this tormenting place and this place of peace and paradise. And they were able to communicate one with the other. And the communication went this way. Um, the rich man calls out not to Lazarus, the poor man, but he calls out to Abraham, who's ne next to Lazarus, and uh, asks Abraham to send Lazarus to get dip his finger in water and to cool his tongue. Um, and the, and, you know, Abraham says, no, he can't, he can't do that. Um, and then he says, will you just send someone back um, from, from the dead? Will you send Lazarus? I know you won't send me back, but send Lazarus back from the dead to tell everyone what's, what's going on in the afterlife so that my brothers could be warned, you know, so that they are on the right side of things before they get over, uh, before they die. And Abraham refuses that as well. Not as if Abraham actually has the power to send the people back from the dead. Right? Abraham is also dead. <laughs> he doesn't have that kind of power. But um, apparently he's the one that, uh, 
that uh, the rich man seems to uh, want to talk talk about. So, with that in mind, that's that's the that's the that's the story. Now let's examine the context and the story itself. And when we get to the end, we'll go back and ask if this is if this is a parable or not. Um, the context here is clearly about money and about um, well, about your your focus and the aim and the goal of your life. Uh, we see that it, at the beginning, we have Jesus giving the um, the parable of the of the uh, unjust steward who had to give account of his stewardship, and then he's wise, even though he's been a terrible steward, he's wise in how he treats others. And so Jesus is saying, then as Christians, as believers, you should also be wise with what God has given you. Um, if if the people of the world can be wise to accomplish their goals. Uh, you should also be wise to accomplish the, you know, the more important thing with, with what God has given you. And then we say this, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Meaning, you can't serve God and money. you got to pick one to be your goal. It doesn't mean you can't have God and have money. It means you can't serve God and serve money. So either you're going to use money and whatever possessions you have for the sake of the Lord, or you're going to use your supposed relationship with the Lord to get money. You know, you can't have both, right? One of them is the focus. One of them is the goal. One of them is the, the purpose that you're using the other for. And there are people in churches who are rich. And there are people in churches who use their riches for the sake of the Lord. There's other people in some churches who are rich, who use their position as a Christian um, in order to actually become more rich. That's unfortunately is, happens a lot of times in some churches with some pastors, right? So that's obviously the wrong focus. Jesus is saying you can't serve both. You got to pick one or the other. And his, his statement angers the Pharisees. Now, why would the Pharisees be angry about this? This statement, you can't serve God and money. <laughs> because the Pharisees were using their position as spiritual leaders to get very wealthy. They would pray for three hours straight in order to make people who walked by on the street feel bad because they didn't pray for three hours straight. And so then they should give money to the one who is praying three hours straight to sort of make up for their not praying for three hours straight. And so they would try to guilt you into giving them more money. Um, and uh, this is all detailed for us in Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus says to the Pharisees that they're hypocrites and that they were more concerned with money and devouring widows' houses than actually um, serving God. So, verse 14, And the Pharisees also, were, who were covetous, <laughs> heard all these things and they derided him. So they start making fun of Jesus for saying, you've got to choose money or God. Because... They'd chosen money, <laughs> but wanted to pretend like they could choose God and money. Um, verse 15, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. Now what he's about to say in the next couple of verses is, is sort of a, a, a summary of a few points that he makes in the Sermon on the Mount. What is the Sermon on the Mount all about? It's about saying that the actual righteousness that you need is not this outward righteousness, that's not bad, but what you need in order to be in the kingdom of heaven is an inward righteousness. Your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of, this, of the Pharisees if you're going to make it to heaven. That's what the Sermon on the Mount's all about. Here he's saying, you guys are not just. You justify yourselves outwardly before men. You want other people to think that you're righteous. But God knoweth your hearts. You need an inward righteousness of the heart and you don't have it. God knoweth the hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The things that make you look righteous is actually an abomination to God if it's not actual inward righteousness. The, the, the appearance of being holy and righteous without any genuineness of being holy and righteous is an abomination to God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. There's the verse that I, I'll just, I'll be very transparent. One day, when I feel like I've understood it, I'll preach on it and try to help you understand it. 
or, or maybe if you think you do understand it, you can help me. But I, I just don't fully grasp that verse. But in the context, I think we can say at least that he's talking about the law and the prophets being something that the Pharisees supposed to, to, were supposed to hold very high, with high esteem, and they wanted everyone to think that they not only kept it, but they went above and beyond the law and the prophets. But I think he's saying there's something more that you need beyond the, the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. At the time of John, he started preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus also preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I think he's pointing out that there you should know by now, it's been quite a while that this has been preached, that there's something more beyond just the outward works of the law. Um, the phrase that I would have a diff difficulty with that I have not fully understood yet is the phrase, and every man presseth into it. That's an interesting phrase. One day I hope to give you an answer on that. Verse 17, and it is easier for, uh, for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So he's saying, I'm not overruling the law. I'm saying what you don't understand is that the law is more than what you think. There needs to be actually inward repentance. And then he gives an example of one of the things. This was a debate among the Pharisees. Whoso putteth away his wife, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another, committeth adultery. Whosoever marrieth her that put that putteth that put away from her husband, that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. The Pharisees had this debate about uh, what was okay, when when was a divorce okay? And uh, there were two schools of thought. One was the school of Shammai, and one was the school of Hillel. These were rabbis um, that taught different things on on the matter. And the school of Shammai was very conservative. They said you can only put away your uh, your wife if if she commits adultery for, for, for sexual sins. And then the school of Hillel said you can put away your wife for anything. Any reason at all is good is a good reason. Um, and, and they literally used as an example of this, if she cooks a bad meal, that is cause, that's grounds for divorce. Uh, so I actually, even in the school of Hillel, would not have grounds for divorce of my wife at all. She's never cooked the bed. Um, <laughs> that's what we call brownie points. <laughs> uh, anyway, so <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. The point is that, J that Jesus, here's the, the Pharisees debating over what is the more holy way, what, you know, what is right. And Jesus says, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Jesus is saying, yeah, you guys don't even understand. If you get divorced, that's wrong. You made a covenant, don't get divorced. Now, we've talked before about, you know, divorce and remarriage and what happens after. That, that's not the point he's making here. He's saying, I'm saying it's never right. Like, don't get divorced. Don't divorce. That is wrong, right? And Jesus is going and saying, it's more than you think because You've made an inward covenant in your heart, and you're all about this outward, what do I have to get to get an outward excuse for this, for this marriage? You don't realize that there's, a, there's an inward thing going on here, and that's the problem. And that's the introduction to this. Then he says, there was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen, linen and fared sumptuously every day. The rich man, obviously, is an example to the Pharisees of themselves. Here's a man who's got all the wealth, and he's also apparently considered to be a generous man. That's why Lazarus is sitting at his gate. You know, people would probably think of him as, as, a, as a righteous, generous, caring sort of guy. The image that he had was probably very good. As a matter of fact, when he sees Abraham, he recognizes him. Now, he'd never seen Abraham before, right? But then, of course, he's not actually seeing Abraham's body either. He's seeing his, his soul in, in this afterlife. So what he's seeing is, you know, I don't know how he knew what he's talking about, but he instinctively wants to talk to Abraham, meaning that he was a Jewish person who had some sort of understanding of the Old Testament and, and you know, the, the Abraham and, and the law and all that kind of stuff. The implication is this guy is the type of guy who 
you know, who the Pharisees would aspire to. They would think of this as the top notch. And so Jesus says, who was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now, it's very interesting that this man has a name. It's a very, very interesting thing, because this, if this is a parable, it is the only parable of Jesus where he names a person. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't name the rich man, because the rich man's going to hell. You know, he doesn't matter in this story. The person who matters is Lazarus, because Lazarus actually has a future. The rich man, when Jesus is telling the story, is already in hell. It's over. There's no chance for him. It's done. So his name doesn't matter. Lazarus does. He has a future in eternity in the kingdom of God. So his name matters, right? And Jesus even says, I know my sheep. I call them by name, right? In the book of John. Jesus names Lazarus. It's also interesting what the name is, right? Because what, what's the rich man going to say? Send Lazarus back from the dead. And what's Jesus going to do a little later on in his ministry? He's going to raise a guy from the dead named Lazarus. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing. All right. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to that verse. But the name Lazarus, I think, is extremely significant. And I think the people who heard this, heard this story and then saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead later, would have been really, it would have been hard not to put two and two together. And so when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, uh, the book of John tells us that people went to see Jesus speak, and also when, he was, when Lazarus was around, they, came, they went also to talk to Lazarus, because they probably wanted to know, what was it like when you were in this place Jesus was describing, this Abraham's bosom? Who... How was Abraham? Because Lazarus was dead for four days. So, you know, the, the theory among the Jews at the time was for the first three days after you died, your body, would, your spirit would sort of hover around your body. Then on the fourth day, you'd actually go to the afterlife, you know, the, the place where you're going, the Abraham's bosom that is described here. That was their theory. I don't think that's true. That's just what they thought. So when they heard that Lazarus was dead for four days and came back, after Jesus talked about a Lazarus guy who was dead and wasn't allowed to come back, they all thought, I want to know what it was like. I want to know what this guy saw. And so they all went to go talk to Lazarus. So I think they put, I think, I don't think it's a stretch to say that people who heard this story put two and two together with the Lazarus who's raised from the dead. But I don't think Jesus is talking about Lazarus here. Because the Lazarus who's raised from the dead wasn't a poor man. It seems like he probably ran a business with his sisters or maybe a, a farm or something like that because the three of them all lived there together and probably inherited a, a property and, from their parents. And um, he, does, he doesn't seem, they, they seem to be benefactors of Christ. They take him in, he stays in their house, they feed people when they come. No, they, they're, not, they're not poor, right? He's not laying on the streets uh, begging. Anyway, it says, and uh, the beggar's name was Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. So he's full of pain and sores, which come from, you know, living on the street. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Now, it's interesting that the angels carried this man to Abraham's bosom. It gives us reason to think that that, you, you ever see the touched by an angel, you know, where the, you know, somebody dies and the angel shows up and he sort of escorts them. That might not be completely false, although it's kind of cheesy and corny the way that it looks. <laughs> All we know is angels actually took Lazarus to a different place. It's almost as if the soul naturally when it dies just goes to hell and angels have to be there to catch the ones who are saved and bring them to where they're going. Right? Um, like that's where we're just destined. Uh, uh, and it says that the rich man died and was buried. Like he didn't need angels to escort him. He's dead. He's buried. But um, angels escorted Lazarus to Abraham's bosom. Now Abraham's bosom is sort of a title that we've started using for this place. 
But what it's saying specifically is here, the angels came and brought him to be beside Abraham, by, by his side. Bosom, that word bosom translated from a Greek word, just means his side, by him. He's, he's next to him. So they, they took him and put him next to Abraham. That's what's, that's what's being said. And so Abraham's bosom is the word we use to call this place. It says next, um, in hell, that is the rich man, he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now the word for hell here is the word Hades. Uh, to be clear, when we talk about hell, we're usually talking about that eternal place of torment. The eternal place of torment is described to us in the book of Revelation as the lake of fire. It's the place that will go on burning forever and ever. In the book of Revelation, we also read, Revelation chapter 20, that death and Hades, or hell, are cast into the lake of fire. So Hades, this place where this guy is, is a temporary place where people are tormented now when they die, who are not believers, and one day, that place, that Hades place, will be cast into the lake of fire, and there will be fire forever, right? So there is a permanent hell, if you will, that's the lake of fire, and there's a temporary hell, if you will, that is better, we, you know, it's called Hades in the Bible, right? When Jesus says, their, their worm is not quenched and the fire dieth not, he's talking about a place, he uses the word Gehenna, which is referring to that lake of fire place, Right? where Hades is just a word to refer to the temporary place. Interestingly enough, both of these men are in Hades. One of them is in torment in Hades, in fire, and he can see across a great distance the other one who's with Abraham, and he's not in torment. He's, he's good. And Jesus said when he died on the cross, he said to the thief on the cross, today I will be with you in, not in heaven, in paradise, in, in a peaceful place, where there's no problems. Here they are hanging on the cross. Paradise isn't exactly where they are now. If he says, I'm going to be with you in a place without this pain and suffering it very, it, today. And Jesus didn't go to heaven on that day. He went to Hades. But he went to a place of comfort and paradise in Hades with the guy who died on the cross, and also with Lazarus and with Abraham and all the people from the Old Testament. So people say, well, hang on. Does that mean that heaven is wherever hell is, like they're all the same place? And the answer is no, heaven is separate from this place called Abraham's bosom. I think, that's, I think Jesus makes that very clear here. And Jesus also mentions in, in John chapter 3, he's talking to Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, No man hath ascended into heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. Even, uh, it, it's he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. So it's a little... You know, you've got to follow the train. Jesus is saying, no man's ever gone to heaven except me who came from heaven and I'm still in heaven. Right? He's God. But what he's saying is nobody's ever gone to heaven. Later, Jesus says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right? So what happens to all the people before Jesus comes to earth who are believers in God, faithful to him, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and all the saints of the Old Testament who were believers in God, who trusted that the Messiah would be coming, had faith in him. According to Romans, it was counted to them for righteousness, right? What happens to them? They can't go to heaven. According to Jesus, no one had ever gone to heaven by the time he was talking to Nicodemus at the beginning of his ministry. Well, they had to go somewhere else. So they went, apparently, to a place separate from the place of torment, but in this afterlife place. That, that can be referred to in the Bible as Hades. That's why in the Bible it says, Thou didst not leave my soul, talking about the Messiah, in Hades, in the book of Acts. It says, He didn't leave the soul of Jesus in hell. Well, he didn't go to the place of torment, because he said he was going to go to paradise to be with the guy. Right? Jesus went to Hades, which had two parts. It had a part of torment. It still is a place of torment today. And it had a part of, of peace and comfort and paradise. And apparently those two places were divided by a giant gap. Um, we'll read that in just, just a minute. Now, we can theorize about where it is. Is it in the center of the earth? Is, is Hades, is hell in the center of the earth? Um, you know, we can't really answer that. Although I will say that 
in the Bible, it does say um, in the Old Testament that um, there were people who stood against Moses and the ground opened up and swallowed them and they went straight down into the pit, which seems to be talking about the bottomless pit, perhaps hell. However, it's interesting that this guy's not falling in this. He's just in torment. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't appear that he's in some sort of bottomless pit that's falling. We don't know the answers to all these questions, but we don't know at least this much. The people before Jesus died and rose from the dead, um, who were believers in God, were not going yet to heaven. They were going to a place that we can just refer to as, it's beside Abraham, in Abraham's bosom. And that after Jesus rose from the dead, he, the Bible says he carried captivity captive. He took the ones who were held captive there in, in this paradise, and he brought them on to heaven. Today, of course, they're in heaven, and that's where we go. When we die, again, probably escorted by angels to heaven instead. But at the time, they had to know Jesus. And so Jesus, when he died, he went down, and it says he preached to the spirits. Now, that probably means he preached to the people across the gap, to those who were in fire and torment, to say, here's what you missed. And then he turned to the ones who were there in paradise and said, I'm the one you've been waiting for. And so now that they believe in Jesus as the Christ, now no man can come into the Father but through him, but they can now come to the Father because they're believers in Jesus as, as the Messiah. Um, anyway, so that's, that's sort of what's going on here, or it appears to be so. Um, and Jesus, Jesus is, is bringing this conclusion that there is a place of paradise in hell, and there's a place of torment in this Hades place, even though this is all temporary, one day there'll be an eternal lake of fire that we can call hell and eternal new heavens and new earth for everyone else. All right. So anyway, it says in verse 23, in hell or Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom or at his side. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Now this, this tells us at least one of two things, it seems. Either their you know, souls are given some sort of form that's something like a body while they're, after their body dies. So that he could talk about fingers and tongues and flames and, and what it feels like. Or they just experience feelings that feel like they have a body, whether they have one or not. Uh, either way, there was no way to, com to, to comfort him, not only because he was a soul um, and water probably would not put out fi the fire, but also Abraham says, verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. This is why Jesus is telling the story. right? You want to live your life for all the good things. You got it rich man. You received everything you were living for. And how did that turn out when your life is over? Because your life is pretty short in comparison to eternity. He, on the other hand, was living for good things. And it turned out that he didn't get all the comforts in life, but it didn't matter because he got what was really important. Jesus knew his name. Now, that was the important thing. And so the difference between the rich man and you would think, was their wealth on this earth. But that didn't really make any difference in the afterlife. What really mattered was whether Jesus knew their name. That was the thing that made the difference, whether they knew Christ or, or, or knew the Lord. In this case, because they didn't know Christ yet, this is someone who died before Jesus' ministry. He is comforted, thou art torment. Verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf. That means a great space fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither they can they pass to us that would come from thence. Meaning God's made it in such a way, or had made it in such a way, it's no longer this paradise place near Hades is no longer there, but he had made it in such a way that you could not pass from one to the other. So it's not like you go to paradise and accidentally slip and fall off a cliff and end up in, you know, or, or vice versa. You, could, you, you can't. This is, you know, you think it's impossible to break out of the rock. Right? What, isn't that, was that to, that's a prison called The Rock or something like that? I think that maybe that's a movie about breaking out of prison. Alcatraz? There you go. Um, but you can't break out of this prison. It's, it's permanent. It's forever. 
the picture Jesus is painting for the Pharisees is you have this life to choose which side of the gulf you're on. When this life is over, the side is set. And you can't go from one to the other, from the other to the one. It's done. Why are you living this life for comfort and pleasure then? You should be living this life for that eternity. Because after this life, you're stuck with what you got. You're stuck with what you, what you did. You know, um, even for us who are on our way to heaven, we know that we have this life to earn rewards that we can cast at the crowns, that we can cast at the feet of the Lord and glorify Him with our, with our lives. These short vapors of lives, we can use those to glorify God for all of eternity, or we can use them for ourselves even though we're going to heaven and then get to heaven and have nothing to show for it. We have this life to affect eternity. And so that's the point that Jesus is making. Uh, verse 27. Then uh, the rich man said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead. He's saying they have the, they have the scriptures. They have the Bible. Let them hear the Bible. Why? Because Moses and the prophets proved themselves. Moses, when he was writing down the words of God, and miracles happened in all of them. And they were, they were part in the Red Sea, and there was, there was lightning and thunder on the mountain, and there was the God, voice of God speaking audibly. There's all these miracles to prove that what he was writing was from God. The prophets, they were prophesying things that were going to happen, and then those things happened to prove that everything they were saying is actually true. And so he says, they got Moses and the prophets. They have all the proof that they need, and they're not believing that. You think sending someone back from the dead is going to help. Now, this, I think, is why Jesus is using this, this name, Lazarus, to show us that when he does bring Lazarus back from the dead, people go because they want to see Lazarus, who, who was raised from the dead. But those same people, it says the Jews, came from Jerusalem to see Lazarus, and those same people were convinced by the Pharisees later to cry, crucify him. Right? They still didn't believe, even though one came back from the dead. They thought it was cool that this guy came back from the dead, but they still don't believe in Jesus. So, he doesn't just say, no, they won't believe even if one comes back from the dead. He proves it by raising a Lazarus from the dead, and people still don't believe. They still reject Christ. Which means that people don't need more evidence. We have the evidence. People need to choose to believe it or not. We, we've got it already. Okay, so verse 28. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. By the way, every person on the other side of eternity, everyone who's died, is, has a heart for evangelism. Every person you've ever known who's, who's ever lived and is now dead has a heart for evangelizing the lost. I mean... You know, I wish we could develop an afterlife heart. You know, if we could see from that side of things, I think it would make us very different. Okay, verse 29. Um, Abraham said unto them, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Then he said, nay, father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. All right, so we've laid out the parable, we've, or, or we've laid out the story. We're going to ask now, is this a parable? If you notice, there's very few parables um, that are going to be similar to this one even a little bit. We're going to break it down, just a few elements of it uh, here in, as we close. First of all, uh, the reason that some would say that it's a parable is because it's a story that Jesus told, right? But that doesn't mean that Jesus couldn't tell a true story, right? It doesn't mean everything he, he said was, was a parable. Now, if you look at the introduction phrase in verse 19, it says, there was a certain rich man, which is similar to the parable he told at the beginning of, the, of this passage. There was a certain rich man. Chapter 16, verse 1. He said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man, and he had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. But notice that in that passage, everything, the, the, the steward and the, and the people that he's that he's going to, um, that he's going, the people that he's going out to to reach and try to convince them, uh, you know, to, to receive him afterwards. Everything has a picture. One, there's a, a, a one in one comparison between the rich man who who is, who is the Lord and his servants who are, you know, who are, you know, who is not, 
who, who's not doing well, but he's being wise with his money. There's comparisons between all of these. Um, where in this passage, you don't really have comparisons, do you? I mean, you have, you have a guy who died. Now, the rich, you're the rich man. The, the Pharisees are supposed to see themselves in that. So there's a, there's a parallel. Um, but everything else in the story, there's no parallels. These are just actual truthful things. Um, what, what, we, what you see as a pattern in parables, like the sower. You know, the sower goes out to sow the seed. The sower is the son of man. The seeds mean something. The ground means something. Whether or not the seeds grow means something. They all have different meanings. But when Jesus gives this parable, he's not giving you a bunch of things that have different meanings. He's giving you things that are just things. And the entire story teaches the principle that he's trying to get, get across. The other thing that I think is, is very obvious uh, is that you have a name for Lazarus. Why would Jesus never names anybody in his parables? He's naming this person because it's a real, it seems very obvious that it's a real person. And then the third reason that I would say that this is not a parable would be because he's actually using events that are not obvious and clear. So the pattern of parables is for Jesus to take things that were just easy to understand and use them to teach spiritual truths, right? So he would take, you know, a, uh, a master and a servant and how the servant sort of was a bad servant, going to be kicked out, and he goes and he, 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 he you know, uses his money wisely. And that teaches a spiritual truth about how what we must use our money wisely, right? Things that are easy to understand teach things that are spiritually more, a little bit more complicated and helps them be simple, right? A sower goes out to sow seed, easy to understand. That helps us understand, you know, how we're supposed to hear the word of God and listen to it and let it grow in our hearts, right? All of these parables, simple, easy to understand, things we see every day, help us understand spiritual truths that we don't understand. Well, <laughs> how does this story do that? This story is using things about Abraham's bosom and hell and stuff we've never seen before to teach what spiritual truth? Well, the spiritual truth about hell and, and Abraham's bosom. There's no parallel here. It's actually talking about real, actual things and using them in a literal way. So there's no, there's, there, you, you don't have this easy to understand earthly things that teach a spiritual truth. If this is a parable, it's the only parable that names somebody, and it's the only parable that doesn't use things on the earth that are easy to see to teach things that are hard to see. It teaches stuff, it uses stuff that are hard to see to teach about the same things, which doesn't seem like a pattern in parables. But I will say that this, that if, even if you were to arrive at the conclusion that this was a parable, you would still have to conclude that hell is a real place, that Hades is a real place. Because Jesus never used anything in any parable that didn't actually exist, right? Jesus never said, a sower went out to sow an apple orange seed, you know? Like, that doesn't exist. There's no apple orange seed, although somebody should look into try to hybrid, make a hybrid apple orange, um, you know? Uh, whatever. The point is that, that Jesus wasn't using things that didn't exist. He would use things that they knew and that were, they were accustomed with, that they were familiar with, that were actual true things to teach spiritual truths that were also true, but harder to see. So even if this is a parable, we have Jesus using he hell, uh, Hades, and the place of torment and all this stuff. Him using those things means that they are real things. Otherwise, he wouldn't even use them in a parable. All the things he uses in parables are true events or true places, whether or not the actual circumstances he talks about in parables are true or not. Um, true circumstances or true stories. So, the bottom line is this. I think it's very obvious that this is not a parable, but even if it is, we can still draw from it that hell is a real place, there's real torment. There was a place called Abraham's bosom, or that we could just kind of title as Abraham's bosom, place of paradise. All of those things seem to be very true, whether this is a parable or not. And it's also um, a true conclusion for us to say, why don't we get a little bit of eternal perspective in our, in our view? Jesus is trying to convince these people not to live their lives for money, but rather to use their money for eternity. And they're, they're making fun of him. And he's saying, if you could only see what people see from the other side of the grave, you would, you would just be crying at the fact that you're making fun of 
of me right now. I mean, like this is, this is something you desperately need, and that is eternal, uh, eternal eyes, it, eyes that see from the perspective of eternity, and then see backwards upon life. I mean, just I know I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know why. I was I was driving in a snowstorm and I stopped at a gas station, and all of a sudden the thought occurred to me: What are what are you going to feel like whenever you die? You know, you're 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 going. Or, or maybe you're like a few minutes away from death. What, what are the thoughts that are going to be going through your head? And instinctively, I knew, I knew immediately that I was going to be thinking, man, I, I wish I had done more. I wish I had done this. I wish I had lived more for that. Um, I would, I'm going to be reviewing my life saying, man, I could have done better. And I'm going to be going into the very presence of the Creator God thinking, Feel like I could have done better. If only I had had the perspective of the end of life before it got to the end of my life. And I think that's what Jesus is pleading with us here in Luke 16. He's begging us to have that eternal perspective. Father in heaven, we thank you for the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I pray that you'd help us to have the eternal perspective that you have on, on our lives. Help us to use our lives wisely for the sake of eternity. And we thank you for giving us this precious gift of life that we may use for you. We pray that you'd help us to do so in Jesus' name.